friends, this day we continue our journey through the book of Acts. If you have been with us um, at any point during the first few months of this year, you'll note that we spent a good amount of time walking through Mark's gospel, concluding on Easter Sunday, and then we shifted to the Acts of the Apostles that last week we meditated on Christ's ascension in that first chapter. And we're going to skip the second chapter for good reason. We'll pick that back up in a couple of weeks when we get to Pentecost Sunday. But we we begin now in the third chapter. Before we read it, won't you pray with me? Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, Lord, you call for songs of loudest praise. So teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above, Lord, here's your mount. I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. And so God of grace and God of glory, speak now a word to your people. A word that will comfort and correct. A word that will challenge us and send us out to do your will and to follow you. It's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Acts, the third chapter, beginning at the first verse, it reads like this. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate, so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and astonishment at what had happened to him. The grass withers and the flower thereof fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Thanks be to God. Beloved, I have been looking forward to worship all week, which is kind of a prerequisite if you're going to be a minister in the first place. But, but what I was most excited about for worship this morning was the chance to sing, O God, Beyond All Praising. Landry and I have been conspiring about this service for weeks now. Before we had written a word of liturgy, before any worship assignments were made, we knew that, oh God, beyond all praising, was going to set the tone for this service. But you might have noticed a little problem by virtue of the fact that it's printed in your bulletin. This hymn is not listed in our hymnal, nor was it included in the celebration or the African-American heritage hymnals with which I was raised. It wasn't a song that I was familiar with, and you might not have been familiar with it either. Its tune never fell on my ears as a child, and it wasn't until I was in seminary during my last year in a season where I was feeling particularly overwhelmed and exhausted and and uncertain about if I really felt this call to ministry and terrified of all the things that remained unknown past graduation. It wasn't until one afternoon in Marquand Chapel on the campus of Yale Divinity School that I first heard, Oh God, Beyond all praising. Not, I'm not trying to be dramatic, but, but it threw me back on my heels. There was something 
about that tune to which this hymn is set that cut right through me and caused me to pause and, and to marvel. There, there was something about the way the notes decided to conspire with one another to produce a sound that reminded me of the sublime beauty that is only found in God. By the time... By the time I processed the sound I was hearing and added the words to it, I was moved to tears. I wonder if you heard what we just sang a few moments ago. Oh God, beyond all praising, we worship you today and sing the love amazing that songs cannot Repay, for we can only wonder at every gift you send, at blessings without number and mercies without end. We lift our hearts before you and wait upon your word. We honor and adore you, our great and mighty Lord. We don't, we don't talk about God like that anymore. And it's it's not just because we aren't hymn writers and music composers. When was the last time you spoke about God with that sense of overwhelming awe? And then that tune, the the music to which those words are set, that that tune faxed it. It was composed by Gustav Holst as part of his work, The Planets, where he's trying to give musical expression to all of the solar system. But but that day in Marquand Chapel, it it wasn't about the universe. It, It was about the fact that this tune testified without even using words to the sovereignty and incomparable majesty of God. Now, why have I spent all this time, precious minutes, talking about music when there's a perfectly good scripture that has been read into our hearing? Well, simply put, it's it's because this hymn is beautiful. And we, as human beings, need beauty. Beauty in our lives, I think it does so much more than we give it credit for. Beauty in our lives and in the world calls us beyond ourselves and beyond the narrow concerns that punctuate our lives. Beauty enlivens our spirits and inspires us to imagine and wonder and marvel. Beauty connects us to God. As one friend put it, Have you ever noticed how each morning God uses the sky as a canvas to paint a masterpiece? Or or how God commandeers the leaves into an open air sky, a stained glass canopy on which to reflect God's light upon us. And I know all of us in this room stood in awe on Monday as the moon passed before the sun and reminded us that the heavens really do declare the glory of God. But even if we bring our gaze down from a solar eclipse just to the space in which we share, there is beauty all around us. It reminds us that there is something more in this world. It's no wonder then that in front of the temple where Peter and John are going to worship, someone decided to construct a beautiful gate. Now, we we don't know which family it was in the congregation that pledged the funds to construct this gate. We don't know which firm was contracted to design it. We we don't know the name of the workers that labored to construct it, but the text tells us it was beautiful. It it was so beautiful that its beauty landmarked it. It, Its beauty became a fixture within the landscape of Jerusalem. Its beauty became a monument to be marveled at because each day, each and every day, faithful folks, on their way to worship, would pass through this beautiful gate. And I can imagine some of them would pause every now and then in awe of its beauty, and it would set the tone for how they would worship God as they made their way into the temple. This beautiful gate, this beautiful edifice, 
constructed as a monument of human love for God. It would, it would set the tone for all who entered to worship. And yet, in the shadow of that very beauty, there are people. People who are not able to make their way into the temple. People there in the shadow of that beauty who are languishing in poverty and despair and pain and neglect. There in the shadow of that beauty, people have been crippled and made unwell, not just by physical ailments, but by the condition of the very society in which they lived. There in the shadow of the beauty, people are languishing. I wonder, wonder if it looked like Idlewild. If the soaring buttresses in which we all sit under followed the curvature of that beautiful gate. Or if the glow coming through these stained glass windows mirrored the golden gleam of that beautiful gate. Here we are gathered sitting in the midst of beauty this morning and I wonder if we have fallen into the same pattern as those worshipers in the temple, where we no longer allow beauty to convince us of what is possible and what can be transformed, but rather we allow beauty to comfort us as we do our best to ignore the things that unsettle us. That's the pattern these worshipers have fallen into each day as they pass through the beautiful gate and marvel at its splendor and find their preferred pew in the temple. They raise their eyes to behold the beauty while just below their line of sight are people begging in order to survive. Beloved, if beauty is supposed to call us beyond ourselves, if it's supposed to help us imagine what is possible, if it's supposed to connect us to God, what does it say that the beautiful gate inspired folks to do nothing more about this unnamed man's condition than to carry him to the doorstep of the temple and position him at the gate so that he could beg while they worshiped? That is the scene that we enter into in this text. While worship is unfolding, this man is begging at the entrance. And he sees coming toward him Peter and John working their way toward the temple to go to worship, and he asks them for some spare change. And the text says that Peter and John stop. They look at him. They encounter him and transform his life. Here's the thing. I don't want to paint Peter and John as the heroes of this text. You know, we have a a, a, a proclivity for making heroes out of our forebearers of the faith. And in doing so, we place them high up on a pedestal and make them these unassailable great men and women of the faith that we can only ever aspire to and that we'll never reach. And when we do that, we lower the demands of discipleship upon our lives. And we lower what we expect of ourselves. Peter and John are not heroes. Because I've got a funny feeling and a sneaky suspicion this isn't the first time they went to church. It's not the first time they've walked through the beautiful gate on the way to worship. And the text tells us this isn't the first time that this man has begged for alms at the front door. He does it every day. In fact, I don't think this is the first time Peter and John saw this man, but the text tells us when this time comes around, Peter looked intently at him. Peter looked at this man with intention, with deliberateness. And perhaps what this text is pointing us to is that this might not be the first encounter between Peter and John and this unnamed man, but this is the first time that Peter and John paid attention. The first time they they paid attention to what might have been on the sign he was holding. 
The first time they paid attention to the fact that this man had made himself small and as insignificant as possible in order to beg for his survival. And then Peter says something I imagine that man hadn't heard in so long. Look at us. Look at us, Peter says, to this man who had gotten into the habit while sitting in front of this beautiful gate to dropping his gaze to the dirt pathway along which he sat. Look at us. And he does. He looks at Peter and John expectantly. Maybe he's expecting to receive some silver and gold or expecting to receive an act of charity. And instead, he gets something that he wasn't expecting. I have no silver or gold. But what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stand up and walk. Beloved, the... The sinfulness this text exposes, it's not just the apathy of those who gathered for worship at the temple. I think the sinfulness that this text exposes is that they were all complicit in a culture where the best that the most vulnerable in their community could hope and expect was a handout or an act of charity rather than the transformation of their very lives. Because Peter, Peter articulates something that we are uncomfortable with, that silver and gold are not enough. We know that we're going to need dollars and cents to meet the acute needs of our most vulnerable neighbors. But if our sense of mission and charity and philanthropy begin with a dollar sign and include a decimal point and end there, then all we're really doing is trafficking in the maintenance of the status quo. And at worst, contributing to the reproduction of human misery in excess. But what if we imagined beyond what we've come to expect for ourselves and and what the most vulnerable in our city expect of us? This isn't the first time Peter and John have been to worship. I'm, I'm quite sure this isn't the first time this man has seen them pass him by through the beautiful gate. But what changed with this encounter is that Peter and John have something more than silver and gold to offer this time. I told you we jumped past chapter 2, and that's where we find out what made such a difference. They had an encounter with the Spirit. Their eyes had been given new vision by the Spirit. Their tongues had been set aflame by the Spirit. And so they were not content to just meet the needs of this man. They weren't content to just meet his low expectations, but they were compelled to transform his life and the very conditions that had maintained his brokenness in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stand up and walk. Take my hand and together let's do what you thought was not possible. Here's the thing, I don't think Peter and John participated in the transformation of this man's life for the accolades. I don't think they did it because it was the right thing to do. Or or, or even what people would expect of them as Jesus followers. I, I think it was that the Spirit had clued Peter and John into something that we, in our Western obsession with rugged individualism and a cultural Christianity that claims Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, the Spirit clued them into something that we lose sight of. I think they realized that their lives were inextricably bound to this man's life. 
think they realized that their encounter with this man had to amount to more than just a handout. More than an act of charity, more than being moved by pity. To put it in the language of Idlewild, it quite literally had to be more than just a meal. I think Peter and John realized something we all need to remember. Our salvation is not a personal pet project that we accomplish on our own. Our salvation has a mutuality to it. Our liberation from the things that weigh us down require one another. I am not well until you are well. I am not free until you are free. I am not at peace until you know peace. And so long as I participate, so long as I am complicit, so long as I even ignore the things that hold you bound, I am unable to live into the fullness of the relationship that Christ has called me into. I need you to be whole and free so that I might be also. That flies in the face of our pull yourself up by the bootstraps, me first ism culture in which we live, and it should. We are not called to go along, to get along. We are not called to acquiesce to a culture that more often than not reduces us to the sum total of what we do and what we earn and what we can contribute. Because that way of seeing the world is ill-suited for people whose lives have been claimed through the waters of baptism by God. Beloved, look around. We sit in the midst of beauty. A beautiful edifice along Union Avenue in a city where over 130,000 people live in poverty. Where the number of school-aged children that are homeless sit at 2,691 as of Easter Sunday. Where two police officers have been killed in as many months and where so many others have had their lives snatched from them by drugs and violence and all manner of evil and that we will never know because they never make the headlines. We sit in the midst of beauty, and in the shadow of that beauty, there are lives that are not well, lives that are not whole, lives in need of transformation. And perhaps the reason we've been so uneasy and unfulfilled and exhausted as a community It's because God is nudging us beyond merely marveling at beauty and beyond the expectations we've set for ourselves and the way things work into a world that has been transformed by the reality of the resurrection. Beloved, the resurrection means that a new way is possible. It means that the impossible becomes commonplace if we have the courage to give what we do have, to give what the Spirit has gifted us, even our very lives, for the transformation of the world. To the glory of God. Amen.